Hello, I'm Pastor Mac Hammond, and this is the first of five special versions of my broadcast, The Winner's Way, normally seen on this channel. I'm taking this time to share with you how the Lord is leading me in a new direction in my ministry, an exciting new direction that has the capacity to change not only your life and mine, but to change our world. Later in this program, I'll be giving away a free booklet titled, Time is Short, How You Can Give the Gospel Wings in the Last Days. Plus, you'll hear a word from Dr. Jerry Savelle, who is really excited about this new vision. Stay tuned. I'd like to start our new series by talking for a moment from 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 12 and 13, which says, We beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and, verse 13, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Now, I want to first of all make sure we both understand that you're not being told to esteem any person any more highly than you would any other. God is no respect to a person's and we're not to be either. And so basically the key word in that first verse is for the work's sake, the work's sake. And of course that means then that if we're talking about what I'm called to do at this point in time, and a new thrust of ministry here, it is for this work's sake that I need to introduce you to who I am. You're to know them that labor among you and are over you in the Lord. Over you in the Lord is a reference to anyone's vision that you serve and then thereby serve God. And this is true for all of us. There is no super important person in the body that has it all. Every one of us has somebody that we can identify with their vision and we're called to be supportive of that vision. So essentially, that's why we see in Luke 16, uh, 12, I believe it is, uh, we see that if we've not been faithful in that which is another man's, who will give us that which is our own? And of course, it's talking about vision or calling or responsibility. We all have other men and women of God that we're called to help with their vision. And if we are faithful, then God will bring us people to help us in our vision. As an example, I have supported Kenneth Copeland Ministries and the Victory Channel uh, for a long, long time. I would suspect over the last six or seven years, we have supported him financially to the tune of more than a million dollars. And that's not to say anything other than I have somebody that, I, that labors among me and is over me in the Lord. You know, I labor with him, but he is over me in the Lord, and I'm called to support his vision. And to the extent that I'm faithful to do that, and there, there are several men and women of God who I support in terms of their vision. This is one possibility for you, the vision that I've been given. And if this is something you identify with over the, uh, you know, days ahead, weeks ahead, then we'd certainly feel honored uh, for you to be joined with us in partnership. So you need to know a little about me first, to know them that labor among you. Well, uh, my life began in Atlanta, Georgia a long time ago. I'm not gonna tell you how long at this moment, but at any rate, uh, I grew up down south, uh, attended college at Virginia Military Institute for one reason, uh, I had always wanted, since my earliest recollection, to fly. Flying had been the one dominant desire of my heart. My dad had worked with Delta Airlines when, when I was born, and my earliest memories are sitting on a pilot's knee in the cockpit of an old DC-3. And so I never wanted to do anything but fly. And I came to the realization that the best way to fly, if you're really serious about it, is to go military. Uh, even back in the mid 60s when I went through pilot training, uh, it cost the Air Force, the military, more than a million dollars to train one pilot. 
it's hard to get that kind of training uh, anywhere else. So I decided to go into the military. I wanted a military education, so after high school, uh, I went to Virginia Military Institute and graduated after four years with a uh, bachelor's degree in English and a regular commission in the Air Force. And so I went down to pilot training in Valdosta, Georgia, went on active duty, went down to pilot training in Valdosta, and for 12 months worked on getting my wings. I met my wife and then we got married uh, eventually after I'd been in the military for four months. And so upon graduation, getting my wings, I got the same orders most other guys got getting out of pilot training and that was Pipeline Southeast Asia. The Vietnam War was going on at that point. Uh, this was in uh, late 66. So I did my first tour of duty over there in 67. I did a second tour of duty there and uh, got credited for flying 198 combat missions. And then I came back uh, to the States. Lynn and I decided we uh, wanted to go civilian instead of military. And uh, basically, I exited active duty in the, at the end of 1970. And essentially, uh, in a brief summary, we moved to Meridian, Mississippi. Uh, one reason was it was fairly close to her mother. Her family lived in Montgomery, but not too close. And that's a joke, uh, not really. But then, uh, you know, we took uh, notice of the fact that there was an Air National Guard unit in Meridian that had f 101 so I could keep up my jet flying uh, while I'm a civilian. It wasn't long after we had moved to Meridian that uh, we had an opportunity to buy, I say we, I, had an opportunity to buy a fixed base operation there on the airport where the Air Guard unit was. And that's just a, a, a business that sells fuel, rents airplanes, charters, gives flight instruction, that kind of thing. So most veterans were able to get a small business administration loan pretty easily. So I used that, bought the business, and then over the next year or so, uh, focused on getting it where I wanted it. And then about a year later, I bought uh, or acquired uh, our first DC-3 because my heart was to start an air freight business. There were a lot of older airline airplanes that had uh, been decommissioned or sold by the airlines that were being converted to cargo. Uh, so I had a couple of DC-3s to begin with and I started the air freight business. Uh, essentially, over the next um, 10 years, the next decade, uh, we built that up to a, we had uh, 33 cities a night across the Midwest and the South that we served in the air freight business. And uh, I had a dozen DC-3s, actually 14 at one point, uh, Convair 600s. And so we were cooking right along <clears throat> I ran into financial difficulty in the late 70s when the Federal Energy Administration was formed because of a fuel shortage in America. And all of the major carriers and third level carriers, major users of fuel, were given allocations to work on. I was allocated 80% of my previous year's fuel burn, but basically that was catastrophic because my Business had doubled since the previous year. Uh, I had just signed contracts for uh, enough route increases that I had twice as much commitment as I did the year before. And so I didn't have enough fuel to fly my airplanes. I did a merger with a Minneapolis-based company in 1978 uh, to give us a little more capitalization and capacity to absorb cash flow shortfalls. Len and I moved to Minneapolis in 78. Uh, I ran the consolidated entity uh, for a couple of years. We actually knew at that point that we were called into the ministry. Um, and so eventually, in a couple of years time, I sold uh, my remaining interest in the air freight business, which gave us the financial ability not to 
have to take a salary for a pretty long time and also were able to help start up the church. So we started the church in November of 1980 uh, in a motel conference room uh, there at the intersection of 454 and I-94 and 55, brother. And uh, that's for you that know Minneapolis. And basically, we, uh, uh, we started with 12 people at that point in time. And today, we have around 12,200 members. And, uh, you know, that's certainly a testimony unto the Lord uh, because I like to think of myself as one of those foolish things that God uses. I had no training for the ministry. I uh, wasn't really motivated to go into it because I felt like I'd be giving up my flying. And, uh, you know, my, right at, at that point in time, I honestly wanted to fly more than I wanted to, to pastor or go into the ministry. But, uh, you know, my wife, who has always been a great influence in my life, helped me see that that was a wrong priority. And so I laid flying on the altar. We went into the ministry in November of 1980, and that began a new phase of our life. And, uh, of course, over the years, the Lord proved that He's not reliant on any man. Uh, he brought increase to the church and and so these are the two things that represent the greatest desires that have ever ruled in my heart. Uh, that simply is flying and aviation and pastoring. I, had a, I grew a heart for the church that actually exceeded the heart I had invested in my flying. I saw myself as a pastor, wanted to do nothing else. That was my focus. But it's interesting that when you put something on the altar for the Lord, you're not necessarily giving it up. Now, you know, there are passages in the Bible that make the case that if we are willing to lose our lives for His sake and the Gospels, we'll gain it. And that's what happened to me in spades. I did the right thing, thing that I needed to do at that point because flying was too important for me I needed to get my priorities right, put it on the altar, and within another 10 years, God brought it back to me in spades, better than it ever had been before. He did so through the friendship and uh, generosity of Kenneth Copeland. And since about uh, 1990, I've been back in flying in the ministry. And we've operated a variety of airplanes you know, there were points during that time when I felt a little guilty because I didn't really need an airplane uh, to pastor a church. We went to several conferences a year and, and did some teaching elsewhere, but not enough to justify owning an airplane. So I started flying other ministers around as I could when they needed. And uh, I started with Brother Hagen as an example, one of my spiritual fathers, and he was getting up in years, and I felt the Lord directed me to go to him and tell him that uh, we'd be happy to take him to his meeting so he didn't have to fly commercially at that point. And we did that for three years, and it changed his paradigm completely of private aviation. They wound up buying their own airplane uh, because there's no way you can put a value on the time and the physical wear and tear that private aviation saves over the airlines. So they acquired their own airplane. And I continued to fly people around in the ministry that I would come across who needed something. And, uh, and then, not too long ago, uh, about three years to be exact, another good friend of ours and a wonderful minister of the gospel, Jesse Duplantis, uh, gave me uh, his Falcon 50, the Falcon 50 that he had flown up to that point. He upgraded to a uh, different airplane, a newer airplane, and, uh, and felt led to give me the Falcon 50. Now, I was blown away because that kind of gift, you know, that, that the magnitude of that financially as well as my heart, I'd never received before. And, uh, and we put that airplane into our maintenance uh, facility and 
began the process of doing the work on it that needed to be done to get all of the inspections current and to fly it again. And so our church funded two and a half million dollars worth of maintenance on the Falcon 50 uh, and gave us basically a, another 10 years, another decade before any major overhauls or major inspections uh, would come due. And so it's like having a new older Falcon 50. And we have enjoyed it uh, beyond what I can begin telling you. And it was in this process of Jesse having given me the Falcon 50 and realizing that now the Lord was beginning to unveil to my heart the next phase of our ministry, which is global church planting, to plant churches outside the United States. Now, there's nothing wrong with planting churches in America, and there are a lot of churches that have multiple campuses in a city. We do. But it's like, this is different. And we'll be talking more about why in a little bit during this series. But he gave me a vision to plant churches around the world. We had an airplane now, Falcon 50, that had more range than anything we had flown before. It wasn't truly an oceanic airplane yet, but for the Caribbean, Central America, South America, it was what we needed. And so we launched our global church planting call this past year. And to this point, the church has funded all of this, but it's not something that the church can continue doing. Uh, therefore, we're going into the arena of partnership with others beyond our congregation. And essentially, we've this year so far with the Falcon 50, we will finish this year uh, with five new churches being planted, three of them in the Dominican Republic. Uh, there'll be one in Antigua, Guatemala, and another one uh, in Bogota, Colombia. And so we'll finish our first year of global church planning with five new churches in the ground. And the Lord used this to help me see that He's actually calling us to plant 50 churches in five years. That seems like a lot of churches, but if we're doing five churches with one falcon and we are believing for a second falcon any day now, uh, then that'll be two falcons, uh, one going overseas, crossing the Atlantic and Pacific, and the falcon we have now working in this hemisphere. And so it's 10 churches a year, uh, 50 churches in five years. But that's if we just have two airplanes. I've never been one to limit God to what my natural understanding might be. Uh, we're believing for as many airplanes, you know, and I'm sure it would be over the time that we can manage, including those in our, our new plan, uh, but I'm believing for as many airplanes as the Lord will give us. He spoke to my heart 25 years ago after he had brought flying back to me in the ministry and said that a long-range part of my vision was to be a nonprofit airline, flying ministry all over the world at no cost. I still don't know for sure what that's going to look like, but it certainly will involve more than one or two or three airplanes. What I do know is that the marks we're pressing toward now to achieve the high calling of God in our life and ministry, the marks we're pressing toward right now uh, can be defined by global church planting. This is where our emphasis is, our heart is, our vision is. And of course, there are a lot of considerations in doing this effectively and doing it as quickly as we need to do it. Men of God, and one in particular that I'll talk more about later, said to me by the word of the Lord that time is short. And that is why he made a major gift to our second airplane, our second Falcon. And that would be Keith Moore, another good friend, and preacher of the gospel that we'll talk a little more about that later. Uh, but the point is, you know, um, we have this mandate to go into all of the world right now 
get as many churches on the ground planted as we possibly can. You know, we'll talk more about the mandate given us in the gospel. I'll say this very briefly. He tells us in Mark, Mark 16, that we're to go into all of the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Whoever believes and will be saved, who doesn't, will be damned. And so that's how a lot of people have defined the Great Commission. Going overseas, going on missions trips, uh, praying with people to get saved. And sometimes the church might start up as a result of that, but no strategy for leaving multiple churches as fast as we can. But yet when I read Matthew 28, 19 from the Amplified, a big light went off inside of me because it says there that we are to make disciples of all nations. And you can't make a disciple of a nation without planning multiple churches in that nation. It means that God gains such a presence in that nation is that that nation begins to pattern themselves after the example of Jesus. That's his ultimate goal. The uttermost parts of the earth planning, planting churches because that's the only way you can make disciples. That's the only way you can grow someone up in the image and likeness of Christ and doing so in a way that there are multiple churches in every nation and it begins to change the complexion of that nation. I get myself all worked up just talking about it. But this burns in me now. This burns in me more than flying ever did. And flying was the passion of my life for most of my earlier life. Well, my priorities have gotten straightened out now. And God's brought flying back to me. Remember, he said, if you're willing to lose your life for his sake in the gospel, you'll gain it. And you gain it in spades. You gain it many times what it could have been without him. And so this is what he is doing in my life, in this ministry, launching us into all of the world with airplanes that have the range and the capacity the range to cross oceans, and the capacity to take multiple teams of people into different cities and countries around the world. That's what we have available to us now in terms of the word of the Lord to our lives. And it's something I am truly excited about and would be so honored if any of you could catch this vision, if you feel drawn to it, then partner with us in this process. I want to show you next time we're together how that will affect your life. Thank you for being with us this morning. Those of you watching this message are key to the fulfillment of this vision of planning churches worldwide. Pastor Mac needs your partnership and you can learn more by visiting our website at machammon.org or call 1-800-321-0960. If the lines are busy, write down the information and try again later. There are three ways you can be a part. First, we welcome you to become a member of our ground support team for a gift of any amount. Our ground support team will receive a video thank you from Mac Hammond and the Way of the Winner booklet, as well as the deep satisfaction of knowing you've invested in God's end time commission to make disciples worldwide. Another way to help us is by joining our flight club for a gift of $1,000 or more. Your gift will be combined with the gifts from other flight club members to plan a church with a pastor in a developing country that desperately needs the gospel. As a flight club member, you'll receive a video thank you from Mac Hammond, a Winner's Minute devotional, two Mac Hammond ministry mugs, along with a bag of jet fuel coffee to remind you of your part in this end time church planning effort. Finally, you, your church, or the organization you're connected with can join our captain circle. By planning a church for $200,000 in a developing nation, our team will do the work. You'll receive a personalized thank you video from Mac Hammond. And when the project is finished, a plaque will be placed on the building in your honor. At the dedication ceremony, you can fly with us or choose one of your members to fly along with our missionary crew to see the fruit of your generosity.
Regardless of how God leads you to respond, everyone who calls or connects with us through our website today will receive Mac's free booklet, Time is Short, How You Can Give the Gospel Wings in the Last Days. We hope the Lord will move on your heart to join us today. Hello, I'm Jerry Savelle, and I have a very special announcement to share with you. I am a close friend of Mac and Lynn Hammonds here at Living Word in Brooklyn Park, Minnesota. I've been coming here for many, many years now, and I appreciate the vision that God has given them. They not only have one of the greatest churches in the world, and I love coming here every year, but God has given them a special assignment to plant churches all over the world. Global church planting. That's their vision. That's their assignment. That's what they're passionate about. And you have an opportunity to get involved and to help them get the job done. You know, Jesus said in the 10th chapter of Mark that whatever a man gives for his sake or the gospels, he qualifies for a hundredfold return. I like to refer to the hundredfold as maximum, the highest level attainable. And it's a win win situation. You get to help people all over the world by sowing seed in this special vision and project. Not only that, but in return, you get to experience maximum harvest on the seeds that you sow. Once again, it's a win-win situation, and I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider sowing into this project. Not only that, but prayerfully consider doing it on a consistent basis. Be a partner with them. I'm telling you, there are great rewards in being a partner in what Jesus is doing, what Mac and, Han, Mac and Lynn Hammond are doing with this vision, and I believe you're going to be extremely blessed as a result of your obedience to help them get the job done. Thank you for listening to me. God bless each and every one of you. Once again, we want you to know that Pastor Mac truly needs your partnership. You have the amazing opportunity to help us plant churches globally by visiting our website at machammond.org or call 1-800-321-0960. Once again, if the lines are busy, write the information down and try again later. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Join us again next week for part two of this special series. I truly hope you'll consider partnering with us in this new endeavor. Have a great day and as always remember, God wants you to be a winner in every area of life.